So good evening, everybody, and welcome. I have honor to uh, be um, a mediator today uh, with our very special guest, Professor Kerry Brown, who is a professor of Chinese studies and director of the Lao in China Institute at, at King's College in London. Also, he is an associate of the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House and has many other titles, which um, uh, I don't want now to, to uh, go over all of them because I want to uh, give as much time to carry as possible. As you all know, uh, the reason why we invited Professor Brown and why we want to discuss tonight with him um, about China is the recently held Congress of the Communist Party of China, which ended only a couple of weeks ago and actually uh, opened a new era of uh, Xi Jinping's rule and um, um, when another new China. Um, so Kerry, um, among over 20 books that you wrote, um, there is one which carries the title, China's World. What does China want? I would really like to ask you to enlighten us and um, share your thoughts about this issue. What is really China's world? How does it look like from the Chinese perspective? Also, um, in another book, one of the latest that you published uh, called Xi, a study in power, uh, you explained uh, about the uh, background of Xi Jinping and uh, where his uh, power come from. So I would really love to, to hear from, from you how, how come that um, in 21st century after all, which uh, we had seen from China and in China, he can drag China back towards uh, a kind of party absolutism. And um, the last but not least, um, I would also like to hear what you think about the uh, relationship between China and Europe. And, um, uh, how should we look at China from European perspective? Um, should we be concerned about what's going on in China? And um, uh, what do you think will happen between Europe and China? So, Kerry, please. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sarana. It's great to see you again after um, some years where we uh, were not able to meet. Um, I. Uh, last went to China less in 2019, at the end of 2019. Because of the pandemic, it's not been possible to go back. So it's been interesting to look at China from outside. Um, and I wonder if I was able to visit again, whether I, how I would change my mind, um, because it's it's a pity that you can't, we, we can't easily go to China at the moment because of quarantines and things like that. Hopefully next year we can. Um, <clears throat> as Sarana said, I have been kind of thinking about China's global role for a long time. The 20th Party Congress, uh, which ended last month, was a sort of strange thing to um, look at and comment on and see what other people had written. Um, it was really kind of something I had very low expectations, <laughs> very low expectations because it seemed so uh, kind of certain that Xi Jinping would remain central to the whole kind of party and state uh, kind of architecture. And of course, he seems even more dominant now than he did even a couple of months ago. We had rumors in the middle of the year about how his premier Li Keqiang was going to oppose some of the measures he brought in, particularly zero COVID. There were rumors about maybe other leaders in the whole party set up, not being happy, wanting to see some changes. And yet I find something very strange having watched Chinese politics for many years. And that is that there is so little real evidence of active opposition. And, and yet China is a very complicated story. It's not that China has become easier, it's society, economics, geopolitical position. I mean, all of these have become more complicated, particularly over the pandemic period, 
Its relationships with the United States are now really tough, despite meeting with Biden a week, a few days ago, made things a little bit better, but America and China are not remotely going to agree um, anytime soon on very fundamental things. And yet we have this amazingly simple story of Xi Jinping sitting, dominating everything, everything, one man. And I kind of look at it and I'm more and more puzzled. How did this happen? So I suppose the natural thing would be to say it must be about him. But I guess my first point today is that I don't think it is about him. The whole system has been building up for a long time on what could be called a sort of nationalistic populism. And this is really replacing or under kind of pins Marxism-Leninism. The Marxism-Leninism is a common language for the elite, a bit like Latin was a common language for the priests in the Middle Ages. But underneath what we're really talking about is the faith of nationalistic China. And this is something that people, I think, really buy into across China. I don't think that most Chinese people care, not the ones that I've known and met in the last 20 years about Marxism, Leninism, they don't really care about that much at all, but they care about a great, rich China. And this almost has a religious significance. This is something that politicians, I think, are going to obviously be very interested in because it is such a emotionally important thing and it really is a basis for all politics. Now Xi Jinping has been the spokesperson for this vision and he has been quite a good communicator of this vision. He's also been lucky. You probably saw during the Congress the strange incident where he was sitting next to the previous leader Hu Jintao and Hu Jintao was made to leave the uh, kind of stage and many people felt that this was a deliberate kind of uh, act to make Xi Jinping, uh, make Hu Jintao you know look small. Uh, I don't know it seems strange Hu Jintao has not been really a powerful person for 10 years and so it's a, a kind of weird thing that Xi Jinping might want to humiliate him in public but certainly the event looked you know kind of it didn't look good it really looked kind of quite sad. Um, Hu Jintao presided over China from the years 2001 to 2000, well, 2012 to 2000, uh, sorry, 2002 to 2012, when he was party secretary from 2000 uh, and, uh, and two to 2012. Um, over that period, China um, quadrupled the size of its economy and entered a period of vast growth. Xi Jinping's politics is really built on the benefits of having that vast economy. And that economy was created before Xi Jinping came to central um, power to be the key central leader. Uh, it was created in the Hu Jintao period. What Hu Jintao couldn't do is communicate. He was a very poor communicator and he didn't really tell a China story. And I think that Xi Jinping's politics and the global role that China has now are in telling a China story, which is partly so that China has uh, an awareness of what it wants to do, and partly that the world understands what China wants to do. The problem, I suppose, is that the world's response to China's story, I think, is very um, anxiety anxious, very anxious. Um, China's story is something that I think unsettles people. And I can come back to that uh, a little bit later. Xi Jinping, therefore, the first thing I think he has done is obviously communicate. He's the storyteller in chief. He tells the China story. Um, the second thing I think that he's uh, done is that he has asserted the strategic role of a communist party being unified, sustainable and central to achieving its nationalistic goals. I mean, the country's nationalistic goals. I think the logic is that China today, economically and geopolitically, is within reach of its great modern dream of being a rich, strong country, a dream that it's had since the end of the Qing dynasty, 
over 100 years ago. But this is no longer a dream. This is actually within reach. It's possible in the next five to 10 years, that we'll all go to bed one day uh, with America's number one as the world's biggest economy. And we'll wake up the next day and China will be number one. Now, per capita, that still isn't uh, that important. China per capita is still quite a kind of low figure, I think about 12, 13,000 US dollars. Uh, so maybe a third, a quarter of the size of the United States or other countries, maybe even less than that. However, symbolically, that is going to be a very incredible moment. It means that unlike you know, anyone's expectations, the world's greatest capitalist in terms of growth size is going to be a communist country. <laughs> so this is really an amazing end of history. You know, the Fukuyama book, The End of History, about, well, liberal democracy is going to, you know, kind of be the, the sort of final governance model. Well, China really disrupts this. And so this is a kind of really incredible a moment. And it's really um, it's very, very possible it will happen. So I think this kind of um, concrete nature, this very tangible nature of the nationalism under Xi, it's not abstract, it's not 40, 50, 60 years away. It's really within the next few years that China could be the world's biggest, you know, number one, that, you know, kind of China is this enormously important military player with the world's biggest you know, kind of Navy in terms of vessels, that it's got, you know, the world's biggest high speed, you know, kind of railway links, all of these things are proof that China's nationalistic, um, you know, kind of aspirations and dreams are real. So I think that gives the Xi, Xi Jinping era over the last 10 years, a lot of urgency. And I think that's why Xi Jinping, you know, kind of is has, as the communicator, the storyteller of this story, but it's not just a story, it's a real thing. And I think that's very, very potent and very powerful. And the Communist Party of China, I think, is making itself central to the delivery of that great nationalistic dream. The logic is all Chinese are patriotic. They want a great, powerful, strong country. They have a collective memory in modern history of China being weak, victimized, invaded, you know, kind of done down. And now, under the Communist Party of China, they can achieve great power status and be maybe number one. And that means, you know, if you want to oppose the Communist Party of China under Xi Jinping, uh, delivering this great nationalistic dream, you're unpatriotic, you're a traitor. I mean, it's sort of an incredible achievement that Xi Jinping and the party have kind of created this necessity that if you're a nationalist you've got to support the party and you can't support anyone else because that would mean instability it would mean doubt it would mean uh, risk and the party is the thing that can really kind of you know achieve things um with minimum risk and minimum instability you know it's the one in control now it can do this if you choose another path you may well not be able to achieve this great goal and I think this gives Xi Jinping's leadership a sort of institutional and a kind of emotional and a sort of narrative strength. And it's not really about him as an individual. In fact, him as an autocrat, him as a dictator. Sure, you could describe him as that. But the Communist Party of China is the autocrat. The narrative is the dictator. And all of these things kind of things that he serves rather than that, you know, that serve him. And I think that's really important when we look at politics in China today, that these big themes are not really about a person and not really about, you know, an individual politician. They're really about this mission, what uh, China in the past often called historic mission. The big change that this historic mission is happening. It's actually becoming real. And that gives this politics uh, a real urgency. When we think uh, about the um, issue of national rejuvenation, this is one of the kind of big themes under Xi Jinping. Um, 
we have to remember that domestically, I think it's a very potent and powerful, um, you know, kind of political message. Um, and it means that no matter what economic or social issues, China's economy now is obviously going through big stresses, the housing market is really looking poor, unemployment might be for young people as much as 20%. The International Monetary Fund says growth may be as low as three and a half percent this year. I mean, these are tough, tough times, and China is not in a relaxing international environment. Its relations in the region and with America are very difficult. You know, this is really looking like it's going to be a tough time. However, the party's appeal through Xi Jinping to nationalism is also incredibly helpful because it means that you can ask for sacrifice, you can ask people to get through the tough time, to always look beyond, you know, the next few years to the moment of rejuvenation and realization. I think it gives Chinese politics at the moment a certain resilience because it's a great kind of thing to fall back on. Um, I think politicians everywhere are likely to become more nationalistic maybe and to like blaming the outside world for these things if things get tough. I don't see why China would be any different. I think therefore it is very likely in the next uh, year or so after this Congress that nationalism in China is definitely going to become strong, uh, stronger and probably more problematic for the outside world. However, of course, in the outside world, Chinese nationalism is a very new and unsettling thing. Um, in fact, Chinese nationalism is not so new, uh, you know, kind of for um, business people or others who've dealt with China. I mean, we've known about Chinese nationalism for maybe a hundred years. But the fact that it's really got this status and this power and this capacity now, um, that's different. In modern history, I think we have become very used as Europeans, Americans, outsiders, to a nationalistic China sometimes, but a China which was economically, militarily, geopolitically quite weak. But the difference now is that Chinese nationalism is in an economy which is currently the world's number two, with a military which is also the second in the world, and as I've just said, with the world's, in vessel terms at least, largest navy, um, and with a kind of geopolitical set of alliances through its trade which are unprecedented. China is now the biggest trading partner, despite the pandemic, of over 120 countries. And this therefore means that it's kind of um, nationalism. It might be similar in some ways to the nationalism of the past, but it's nationalistic capacity, that's different. And that means that it is creating huge stresses, I think, for the outside world in how to respond to this. Is Chinese nationalism disruptive, aggressive, assertive is Chinese nationalism about coming into our environments trying to have influence in European American and other places politics is it going to be that we're looking at uh, a new world where China um, as maybe the most dominant economy in gross terms is going to basically ask uh, or force uh, us you know as outsiders to do things uh, to become certain things I think this is a big debate. A lot of uh, our debates um, in, you know, kind of the rest of the world are about China, um, you know, kind of influence in Europe. Uh, Zorano asked about European attitudes towards China. There's a very big debate. There probably is a deep debate in Croatia about, uh, and elsewhere in Europe, in Britain, in France, Germany, about, uh, you know, kind of does um, uh, China influence, you know, our politics. Um, I don't know. I mean, so I won't, give, I mean, I, I'm very skeptical, I'm very doubtful that China is good at influencing politics, because I think it's too prominent, and it upsets people too much, it seems to be counterproductive. However, what China has certainly done is created a psychological war in some ways, I mean, not deliberately, but I think it has been very unsettling for the outside world. And there's many debates, uh, and doubts, and that's new, I think, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, when I was a diplomat working with China, I never really thought that China's diplomacy would be so forceful in terms of creating so much doubt and uncertainty in the outside world, in Europe and America in particular, in the Enlightenment powers. And I think this 
is really a new feature that China almost accidentally, through being so big and powerful, um, has created a lot of uncertainty and doubt about the values and the kind of principles of others to themselves. Um, the question I suppose that I find fascinating in contemporary China is that it seems um, that China has invested an enormous amount in the last 10 years politically into answering the question, who are we? Uh, identity politics with Chinese characteristics. And of course, the great uh, person for, for, for doing this, Wang Huning, was one of the leaders besides Xi Jinping last week, reappointed one of the only two, I think two leaders reappointed from the standing committee the previous years. Wang Huning is the most important ideologue in the world at the moment and the most successful and has been successful for nearly 30 years. He is immensely powerful and important. His core ideas, I think, are two. Um, the first is that power resides in China in culture, not the economy. Xi Jinping is not interested in the economy. He is interested, I think, in power that comes from culture and in this idea of China being um, a place which has 5,000 years of traditional, uh, you know, kind of heritage, culture, identity. This is a huge basis for its power. And this is something that Chinese people should be confident about, that they know the answer to this question that really troubles everyone else. Who are we? For Xi Jinping's China, the answer to that question is, we are Chinese with 5,000 years of continuous civilization who are able to say, you know, that we have this amazing cultural power. And that means that we don't give in to the culture wars that have divided and, you know, look like they're going to destroy uh, other powers. China, I think, looks at the United States today, therefore, with very different eyes than it did, did, than it did in the 1980s or 1990s. In fact, I can give a very good example of this. Wang Huning, the man I just referred to, in 1989, before the Tiananmen Square uprising, visited America briefly and wrote a book, America Against America, a very prophetic book, which basically was admiring of America's energy, dynamism, and much of its economic ability, but said that America was too divided and culturally confused and did not know what its identity was. Now, I'm not saying that that was right or wrong as an analysis, but I think that that describes well the mindset of Chinese leaders today. Wang Huning is regarded as a prophet in this system because he had an insight into the way in which America, 20, 25 years later, would become so visibly divided in its domestic politics. And we've seen that in the last few years, even though in the midterm elections, America seems to be shifting to a more kind of equal or, or balanced or stable position, maybe, it is still obviously a country with very deep divisions. And a lot of those divisions are over cultural issues and identity issues. And China has invested massively in ensuring that they do not happen in China. It has done it through persuasion, ideology, propaganda, and repression. And this so far has worked. I think this is a huge gamble. It may well be that this will not continue to work. There are profound divisions in Chinese society, but at the moment, Xi Jinping and his colleagues can look at a country which seems to have some kind of consensus or unity and be um, joined up in the way in which it regards its own identity. So I think these are the characteristics of the Xi era, and it really explains how it sees itself and the way the world outside sees it. I will say a couple more things, and then I'd be very happy to listen to your comments and, uh, you know, kind of questions or, or any uh, points that you wish to make. The first is that having described this kind of political setup in China, um, I cannot see a way in which that sort of nationalistic, populistic Chinese politics is going to accommodate easily to uh, a predominantly American-led kind of global system. 
um, I don't mean that America dominates this system. What I mean is that America at the moment is the largest and most influential economy still, and that this system obviously was one that America took a huge role in building. But China, in I think China um, engages with this global system in a very different way uh, than the norm. It regards the system that exists at the moment as useful. Um, it has utility. It's kind of, you know, kind of something that is, you know, creating maybe predictability and some sort of um, instrumental certainty. But China does not believe in the underpinning values of that global order. I mean, it clearly doesn't believe in the Enlightenment values that I think uh, uh, others, you know, American Europeans do believe in. Uh, it um, and the reason it doesn't is because it says so often, very loudly under Xi Jinping, it does not believe in those values. Um, I mean, it was saying it before 2012, but now Xi Jinping, through the you know kind of various ways in which China has rejected Western universalism, Western historic nihilism, you know, these kind of things, Western um, decadence. I, I mean, all of these terms are used in China. Um, and they really are a rejection of the values of the Enlightenment global order. Instead, China believes in a world of transactional harmony. And by that, I mean, it is okay for there to be rules because that makes things happen. But those rules are only there so that you do your thing and the others do their thing. And you don't have to agree on why you're doing the thing you're doing. Um, for instance, if you want to do trade as a capitalist in the West, then you're serving your shareholders and you're looking after your capitalist system and that's your business. But the trade that you're doing, the, the actual action, that's the same. In China, you do trade in Xi Jinping's China in order to invest, build and support the nationalistic vision of a great strong country. Part of that is with state enterprises. Part of it is through entrepreneurs, but the investment is the same. It's a nationalistic collective investment. So clearly very different outcomes for the same economic activity. And I think we get this all across the economic terrain. Now, I think that this means therefore that we have to accept uh, a world in which there are um, radically different um, value systems, even though there may be the same instrumental kind of framework within which people work with each other and combine with each other. You could say that that is a dual track world. Um, it may be a multi-track world. I mean, I, I guess for simplicity today, I'll, I'll just describe it as a dual track world. You have a kind of China dominated world and let's call it a US dominated world broadly. They exist in different kinds of spaces. That's not a cold war. Well, they're competing for the same space um, where there's a nice neat boundary, you know, an iron curtain or, you know, kind of a, you know, a kind of actual physical place where you can step from, you know, the free West into the, you know, kind of communist world. No, it's not that simple. Uh, the China and US kind of worlds are sort of mixed up with each other. Um, they often use the same kind of international organizations, maybe, you know, the UN or WTO or even the IMF sometimes. Um, they are investing in each other. They are integrated in many ways. And perhaps more importantly, um, they are facing very similar global challenges. Uh, climate change, pandemics, nuclear proliferation and sustainability and economic growth. So they have a lot in common, but they fundamentally are driving at different strategic objectives. As I said, for the Chinese one, it is really a bespoke nationalistic vision of China having a place in the world where it is respected, has status, basically has transactional relations, but does not buy in to the global values or the enlightenment values of much of the rest of at least the developed world. So very finally, on Europe and China's relations, just to bring it to, I guess, a um, point where 
uh, we, you know, we can probably conclude. Firstly, European policy towards China recently has been fighting with a common problem, which is how do you deal with a, a kind of new global uh, situation where your biggest, uh, one of your biggest, if not your biggest economic partner is also one of your biggest security problems. Um, many countries have this problem in Asia. Um, I think it's very, very common that China is the biggest economic partner, investor, trading partner, but it is not a security partner. It has a totally different outlook. Um, so the Europeans are also now struggling with the fact that they are looking um, at two major partnerships where they are being asked for loyalty and allegiance, which divides them, America and China. Since Trump's presidency in 2017, obviously America's relationship with China has become much more competitive and much more difficult. And since the pandemic, much more difficult. And America has asked more and more for um, European loyalty and allegiance saying that security is the most important thing and economics is the second most important thing and Europe should be loyal to its alliance through NATO and other uh, organizations with um, America. And of course, Russia and Ukraine has intensified this. Oh, However, it does not change the fact that economic situations mean that China has to figure in European prosperity and we've seen that with the German Chancellor's visit to Beijing only in the last week or so. How do you create balance? The solution for Europe was, in the last two or three years, to have a three kind of pronged approach. You regarded China as a collaborator, competitor, and adversary. And it depended on the area where you were working. Obviously, in combating climate change, China is a collaborator. In economic areas, it's probably a competitor sometimes, sometimes a collaborator, sometimes a competitor. In security issues, it's often an adversary. This is a similar structure that is used by, for instance, the United States. Uh, Anthony Blinken used the same uh, three uh, kind of um, areas to describe United States-America a relationship with China, uh, I think about 18 months ago. The problem with this uh, three kind of, um, you know, three pronged uh, view is one, it is of course unstable. I mean, issues go from being ones where there's competition to ones where there's collaboration or sometimes ones where there's an adversary. It changes day by day. And so it is not a very stable policy framework in order to try and sort out what your policy approach to China is. The second problem with this approach is that with America, it doesn't necessarily mean that its view of where China is a collaborator and Europeans' view of where China is a collaborator is going to be the same, a North or competitor or adversary. So even though you're using the same three issues, you don't necessarily align with your allies. And there's lots of space for misunderstanding and miscalculation. So, of course, in terms of words, it seems like you're um, doing the same thing and have the same approach. But I think actually America and Europe, with this sort of three kind of pronged approach, have plenty of space for misunderstanding. And that certainly happened in the last couple of years. And the third reason is because China does not use a three-pronged approach in its foreign policy. The extraordinary thing about China is its foreign policy is really uniform. It's transactional, it looks for benefit, and it avoids things that might harm it. And that is very, very kind of brutal and simple approach. It does not think of collaborator, competitor, adversary, and make things very complicated. It is extremely, um, I think, uh, you know, kind of uniform in its view. And therefore, I think its diplomacy in response to Europe talking about collaborator, competitor, adversary 
is to say, well, you can't have all three. Who are we to you? Are we an adversary? Then don't deal with us. Are we a competitor? Okay, let's compete. Are we a collaborator? Cool, let's collaborate. I mean, it's sort of not really kind of saying, you know, uh, yeah, we'll play along with your game and we'll stick to your three headings. It's kind of saying, yeah, you have those, but actually the reality is, you know, our rules are that we'll play with you where it works for us and you should do the same. And if you don't want to do that, that's cool. But we have one rule, transactional. So I think that this is going to mean for Europe um, that it's uh, going to have a fairly um, uh, big balancing act to continue. I think in conclusion, um, this is going to be a, a really kind of golden age for diplomacy because this is going to be about constant management and actually trying to contain, uh, to maintain the status quo. Um, Europe is very idealistic. Europe likes to have big ideals. It is not exciting in Europe to talk about maintaining the status quo. To me, status quo is really cool and exciting. I think that is obviously a very boring thing for politicians to strive for. But with China, I think the only thing that we can ever really go for is status quo and management, because I cannot see in the short to medium term resolving the very profound values differences that I've talked about. In the longer term, well, I mean, there's a possibility, but not in the next five to 10 years, I don't think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerry, so much. Uh, and um, I have to say that no wonder that in UK you are praised as uh, one of the most um, perceptive and accurate observer of China. You prove it each time when I hear you speak and uh, when I read your books. Uh, unfortunately, I completely agree with you. And I say unfortunately because it looks, uh, it sounds pretty scary. Uh, I want to ask you first two questions and then um, other participants can ask questions or comment on what you said. Uh, when you were speaking about this nationalistic goal that China is about to achieve, you didn't leave any uh, room for um, possibility that China doesn't achieve it. Is there anything that can stop China on that road? And another question is, um, uh, what, what happens with Taiwan? Um, is Taiwan, you didn't mention Taiwan by word today. Um, is Taiwan something that um, uh, is uh, inevitable, a crisis that we, we were facing? Is there something that can prevent China from going and invade Taiwan and take it as it says it would? And uh, what if it does? Um, start uh, any kind of invasion. What should we do then? Well, <laughs> I think if we, uh, yeah, that that would be well. We should sort of dig, dig a deep hole in the ground and just hide for a while, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, the, so the, there's plenty that could stop China achieving its nationalistic goal. I mean, um, we sort of probably have become lazy uh, about you know, the number of problems that China faces. Um, in the past, you, you remember 20, 25, 30 years ago, it was always worrying about China's stability. And, you know, is it gonna fall apart? Is the Communist Party gonna you know, collapse? And, uh, you know, many people were writing about it then. And I think in the last 10 years, we've gone the other way. And now it's like, oh, this is, you know, China so strong, it's gonna carry on forever. And, you know, um, and I think neither are accurate. I think. China has massive climate, uh, you know, environmental issues. This summer, huge droughts, uh, heat so strong in Chongqing that people's shoes were melting. I mean, incredible. Um, it's also, um, you know, suffering from, uh, you know, kind of water shortages. Um, it has um, set itself goals to deal with this, but I think they're not ambitious enough. Um, it has uh, demographic issues, as you know, I mean, an aging population, but also gender imbalance. Um, it has very uh, big issues of, of inequality. I mean, all these things we used to think a lot about. And under Xi Jinping, this very confident leadership maybe has made us think these are all sorted out, but they're not. I mean, obviously they're still problems and they're very serious. And any of those could create um, economic or social unrest that could be devastating. 
um, the zero COVID lockdown, um, we've seen a lot of protests. We see them in Guang, uh, I think Guangzhou at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the state can put lots of repression into this, but if you have these, uh, you know, repeated across China, they could become very, very problematic indeed. So uh, there's plenty that could stop China achieving its nationalistic goals. The problem is, for the Communist Party of China, it has invested so much in this being the great objective that I don't think it can find an alternative. You know, it's got to go along this road and it can keep on saying, you know, well, it'll take a bit longer. We need a bit more time. But I mean, its nationalism, I think, is so important to its legitimacy now. And so I don't think that we're going to see any changes. You know, I, I mean, this is a big commitment. Um, the problem for the outside world is that just because China's nationalism doesn't work and it starts to sort of fail to achieve this great vision, a failing China is as is is a bigger problem than a, than a China that's succeeding. I mean, this is another thing I think we've forgotten that although Xi Jinping and his leadership are a problem for the outside world, a failing China is a bigger problem. Uh, and we spend so much time attacking China and saying, you know, that this is good, no good, you've got to change. We forget that, in fact, a failed change could be a devastating thing. So it's, it's, um, its failure is not going to be a good thing. On Taiwan, so I think despite the kind of strong words used at the Congress um, by Xi Jinping, um, despite the anger and the reaction to Pelosi's visit in um, uh, October, I think, or August, August, um, I think China is unlikely to do anything uh, too much unless it is provoked by um, the American election in 2024 or a Taiwanese election in 2024. So 2024 is the big, you know, this is a critical moment. If you have a Taiwanese leader, so Tsai Ing-wen um, comes to the end of her second period in power, um, she has to go, and so there'll be a new president. Um, if you have a president that is strongly in support of independence, um, then we have a problem. Now, if that happens also with a new American president, who's also supportive of a stronger line on Taiwan, does not recognize the one China policy, wants to be more adventurous, then we will have a Chinese response. I mean, I think they have um, committed themselves to a response. That may be a blockade. Um, I think a military kind of attack would be unlikely, but it's it's possible they would do something militarily. I mean, you know, these things, all of them would be possible if China felt it was provoked. As long as there isn't provocation from what Xi Jinping said to Biden a few days ago in Indonesia, I think um, it is likely that they will just try and maintain the status quo. I think that's because China believes now, rightly or wrongly, that history is on its side, that basically the West is declining, China is rising, and you could leave this issue for 10 years, a few more years, and it will be a choice of Taiwan sticking with a failed West or Taiwan joining a winner. This is, I think an ideal outcome for China. The problem is that uh, obviously the 23 million people of Taiwan um, have a different view. So um, I think uh, it's, as I said earlier, status quo in this is the only way I can see this being resolvable. Um, the final thing, that really weird thing is, <laughs> of all the Republican candidates in 2024, the one that is least likely to do something dumb on Taiwan is Donald Trump. <laughs> so, I mean, in every other area, you know, everyone goes crazy and says, oh God, if Trump returns, it would be, well, oh my God, what are we gonna do? On Taiwan, he is not probably likely to do anything crazy, but some Republicans would. And that, that's kind of scary. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, Gary, yeah, indeed. And again, uh, unfortunately, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do we have any questions? Bojo. 
thank you very much uh, and uh, thank you for a very very interesting lecture Kerry uh, well you uh, you said that uh, Chinese uh, politics uh, is generally nationalistic my question is uh, is it realistic to expect that Chinese politics uh, can be different uh, especially bearing in mind uh, uh, economic sanctions against China, bearing in mind security alliances against China, uh, uh, which are created uh, or supported by uh, by United States. Uh, and uh, uh, the first question is, is it realistic, uh, bearing in mind those circumstances uh, that uh, to, to expect uh, Chinese politics to be different than nationalistic. And uh, uh, the second question is, what would happen if uh, Chinese politics under communist rule becomes internationalistic? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, your, que your second question, I think that Chinese believe in the party at least that they are internationalist i mean i think they they believe um you know that they they are they have a very kind of um collaborative international outlook i mean the international liaison department of the communist party maintains relations with something like 690 political parties across the world so um i mean in that sense yeah they're internationalist but i think um to come to that the first question, you know, it relates to what you just, the second question. Um, they are, I think, strong believers in Chinese uniqueness, that China has a unique role in the world, and that therefore, um, you know, it, while they're global, um, they're global as Chinese, you know, I mean, the, the, this idea of, you know, an internationalism where you're almost not, not really a citizen of anywhere, I think China doesn't believe in that. It believes that it has a strong identity and that's unique. And I think that's the reason why I don't think China wants to be a, you know, a new United States. It doesn't believe that its values can be transported elsewhere. You know, they're Chinese values. To have them, you have to be Chinese, you know. You, you know. And so I think it's got a very bespoke view of its, um, its role. So I don't think actually a China without nationalism to me would have one huge problem, which is that it would then not be coherent. I mean, because to be honest, uh, China is, you know, many different things. I mean, um, it, you know, there are very big differences most easily between Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia. So there's one problem. If you get rid of the nationalism, that will be a problem with these places which dissent from that at the moment. Um, but also within China, you have huge differences between regions and that's um, within living memory, almost within living memory, China was fragmented. There were different areas and regions which had different leaders. And that's a kind of nightmare. You know, China's worst nightmare is for the place to divide up. So I don't think uh, a nationalistic, um, uh, you know, a China without nationalism would, um, would work. The question is, what kind of nationalism? Um, and I mean, I think um, there's a sort of benign nationalism, which is, I guess, you know, like patriotism, you know, following um, the country's sort of uh, economic and, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, cultural success, um, sporting success. Yeah, I mean, everyone has these things. Where Chinese nationalism becomes less um, kind of easy to live with in this strong assertion over the region, the South and East China Sea and Taiwan in particular, this kind of you know sense that this is China's and that its neighbors have to kind of you know really um, concede to it. And obviously uh, its neighbors, Vietnam, Japan, South Korea, in particular have a long history of managing China but not um, agreeing with China <laughs> um, 
and in a sense, we have to study Japan, the South Korea and, and Vietnam. I mean, they're, they're, they should be our teachers now. They have had a deep skepticism towards China for 2000 years. <laughs> so, you know, and they kind of, you know, they're brilliant at the diplomacy of sucking up to China and giving China face and, you know, saying how great China is and then doing their own thing. Uh, but I think the problem today is that China's demands are impacting on them, particularly Vietnam and um, yeah, particularly Vietnam because of the South China Sea. So nationalism in these places, that could be pretty damaging. That, that's the less likable form of nationalism. Thank you. Um, I was very impolite. I didn't uh, introduce Boja Kovacic, is a former ambassador to Russia of um, Republic of Croatia and uh, uh, one of our Croatian specialists in Chinese affairs, and he writes quite often about China. Um, and uh, now we have a question by um, Anna T, who says, um, who asks you, is it not likely that the people of China could support the party not out of nationalistic drive, as you call it, but perhaps because they brought China to the point where they're about to become the wealthiest nation of Earth, starting from a country devastated by Western colonialism? Does it not make sense for Chinese people to give their support to such a party that has brought such advancements to their quality of life as compared to after the opium wars and in the shortest time ever? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess the kind of economic benefits that China has, um, you know, kind of brought to the country are, you know, I mean, they're, they're important. They're the basis for its, um, uh, you know, the party's legitimacy but I don't think they're enough. I mean, it's got to be more than that. I mean, you know, if you're just basing your appeal on um, the party, basically, you know, delivering material goods to people um, and making things better than they were in the past, I think that's, you know, that's that's obviously a nice basis for your, um, you know, kind of support. But the Communist Party wants more. I mean, it wants to become sustainable. It wants to make one party rule the norm. Um, and for that, I think you have to do more than just give people material goods. You have to speak to their hearts. Um, the problem with the Communist Party is that it's not got an easy story. Marxism, Leninism is not a way of appealing to people's hearts. It's a you know, rational system, I suppose. I mean, it's, um, you know, appealing maybe intellectually, but it's it's not really kind of arousing people's um you know, kind of emotional commitment. And I think what Xi Jinping or, or the Communist Party under Xi Jinping wants is real emotional commitment. You know, if you get people's emotions, then they'll follow you. Um, you probably remember the era of uh, Bo, Bo Xilai. Um, you remember in sort of 2000, and, I think, um, seven to 2012, when he was party secretary of Chongqing. And I remember um, at the time talking to a Western politician and, you know, all Western politicians that had met Bo Xilai, they really loved him. They thought, oh, he's a great guy. And I sort of said to this West, it was a German politician, actually, a very senior German politician. I said, why, why do you like Bo Xilai? He said, this is the only Chinese politician I've ever met who speaks to people's emotions. <laughs> and he said, we can relate to him, you know, because that's what we do. And I kind of thought about that a lot and thought how much Xi Jinping owes to Bo Xilai. You know, a lot of his policies, his clamp down on mafia is a bit like the anti uh, you know, corruption campaign, his you know, red song campaigns are a bit like the nationalistic campaigns. And, you know, Bo Xilai was a very effective communicator. And of course, then he was um, removed for corruption and other things. Um, it's just a strange thing that, you know, actually, you know, the kind of politics that Bo Xilai launched were the ones that were in, in the end I think have become the norm in China. And so, you know, nationalism to me is a natural thing for a Chinese politician to capture, you know, the, the stories, the language of people's emotions um, and, and not just to appeal to, you know, it, it, yeah, it's good to say, look, your lives are getting better materially. We now have, you know, a better life than we've ever had before. Um, we're not being bullied by the West. We've got through our history. 
but you've got to have something beyond that. And I think, you know, the vision of being a great, strong country that's looked up to and has status is, I, I think, the kind of thing that the Xi politics is really built on. And that's quite an emotional politics. It's not a, just a rational calculating politics. Thank you. Do we have any other question? Um, um, I have a question in the meantime, um, waiting for the others. Um, there was one article after the party Congress, which says um, we all misread uh, the uh, um, report that uh, Xi Jinping uh, gave to the delegates of the party Congress. And uh, um, that article says that actually what we can expect now is once Xi Jinping has um, um, gathered all this uh, uh, power in his hands, he only now can open uh, radical reforms. And these, those reforms will be um, something which um, would bring China to the, in, uh, to, to the, um, to the leading uh, place in the world um, econo uh, te in, in technology. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this theory s s goes on and says, um, now when he, he doesn't have anyone to oppose him, um, he will put enormous effort and enormous uh, resources and uh, money into development of um, all kinds of technologies, of course, knowledge in general. Mm -hmm. And by this, uh, Chinese society will change again, and uh, we will, uh, um, uh, from that basis, we will, uh, as Chinese will, will get an, another kind of freedom, and uh, um, it, it's not going to be as it looks like, like um, it's not going to be just a dictatorship and um, mm. uh, authoritarianism. Would you agree with that, or do you see any possibility? Mm. Uh, I, I want to say when we were together in China, Hu Jintao just came up to to that post, and we all expected him to be this big reformer, yeah, okay. uh, which was great disappointment, of course. So, what would what do you say about that possibility? Well, I guess I um, like you, having dealt with China for a relatively long time. I mean, not, not as long as you, but a relatively long time. I guess I've learned one thing, and that is um, how many decades and hundreds of years to Europeans particularly have to daydream about China being what they want and why can't we just accept it the way it is and so this dream of the liberal Chinese reformer I think is um, I don't know what it means anymore I mean these people are brought up in a system where they're you know trained from day one to have a certain world view and that worldview, I think, is um, that the liberal West is not a great model uh, anymore. I mean, I think in the 80s and 90s, maybe they were more interested in, um, you know, kind of what the, the West was doing because we were economically very successful and economic, you know, politically probably more successful. Uh, but I think a big impact, you, you mentioned one of your colleagues, um, Bojo, um, you know, dealing with, with, with Russia uh, and China. I mean, I... I I think it's amazing how uh, what happened in Russia in the 1990s really reinforced the Communist Party of China's view that what a disaster, you know, what an absolute disaster. And then what happened in 2008 with the global economy in America and elsewhere, I think China just thinks more and more of the, the outside world being, you know, kind of full of terrible decisions and, you know, always coming with very bad models for China to use. And I think they kind of think today, God, if we had followed your advice in the 1990s, we would have been ruined. And, you know, so we're not going to listen to you again. So I don't think um, there's a liberal reformer or a, a reformer that's got a big idea about democracy in China. However, um, I do think that there's probably going to have to be big, um, you know, rethink about political issues in China, which means not, you know, I don't think they're going to be using Western models, but I think there is going to have to be some change at some point because you get a more middle income country. And I don't know what that will look like. It will probably be very different to anywhere else because of the scale, for one thing. But I think it will definitely have to, you know, involve more kind of participation of some sort 
and the COVID-19, um, you know, these sort of protests, it's quite interesting in Shanghai, you know, there was a big anger and the Shanghai middle class are, you know, like the most important middle class. Uh, I was quite interested how, um, you know, that, that Xi Jinping was willing to really antagonize these people. I, I thought Shanghai middle class were like, you know, the most important, one of the most important groups. Uh, but obviously he was willing to support policies that really angered them. But at some point, you know, if you have too many people in the middle class being annoyed, you must have a problem, right? And you must have a problem. So I, I think um, the idea of reforms of some sort, yeah, I think that's probably plausible. But I don't think that, you know, they'll be like the West, because I think China would regard those as not um, successful. Mm. Thank you. Do we have any other question? I would be interested in uh, one more uh, aspect. Sorry, I think Andrea, Andrea and Dejan, yeah. is it De Dejan? Um, Sorry. Yeah, there's two hands up. Two hands up, yeah, Andrea, BG and myself, but I think Andrea first. Uh, Andrea first. Can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. I yeah, can, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yoed, and uh, hi, Tarana, and thank you, Professor Brown, for what has been an insightful and I have to say very exciting presentation. I haven't heard something so intellectually stimulating and precise um, in a long time in China. I'm the charge of affairs at the Australian Embassy. I had a posting in Hong Kong. Uh, what I'm about to ask and say, obviously, it does reflect my own views, not the, by, by the by government. It might be also, you know, uh, affected by the fact that I haven't been in China for, for so long. But I was really uh, impressed by, you know, one of the key questions that you pose is how do you deal with a situation where your biggest uh, trading partner, in a sense, your banker, is also your biggest security partner, is also your policeman. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, you know, there might be an alternative um, to that. That is a very pointed question, you know, but China doesn't exist in a vacuum, you know, it exists in a very um, diverse and economically pro promising area, which is, you know, the Indo-Pacific. There are incredible economic opportunities and dynamism economically in the region. You have India, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, uh, the entire Asian uh, countries. So you could create some sort of um, strategic equilibrium uh, around, for example, Asian, uh, because, you know, China prosperity itself has not been built in a vacuum as well, it's been enabled by the very rule of the liberal system, which they now sort of claim to want change. Uh, the security that's been provided for the trade has enabled the prosperity, the rules of the trade. So do you think it's possible to, to create a system in the region which is you know, open, inclusive, resilient, um, the sort of with engagement from Europe maybe in the region so that we can support and establish trade rules that will continue to allow China prosperity without need to, you know, resort to just the bilateral um, ways and to some security show that, you know, there are costs to, to actions. Um, what do you think? Do you think that that's possible or we should just focus just on China and the rest of the region kind of comes after? I mean, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the Indo-Pacific is a sort of um, what, what people you know, try and do as a counterbalance, you know, I think the, 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 the problem you're referring to is, is really, you know, um, what, what's your, you know, what, which a lot of people are looking for is, you know, a, a counterbalance to China, an alternative to China, you know, so that you don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. And, you know, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of trading partnership, in terms of um, other kinds of corporations, you, you know, is there a sort of, um, you know, a kind of region without China where you can kind of um, have a, a balance, you know, a sort of um, restraining balance to China. So I think the Indo-Pacific is, is what people are trying to sort of invest in to create this, you know, Asia without China, you know, so that it sort of gives a, a sort of restraint um, to, to what China is um, and its influence. I, I mean, I can understand. I mean, that's kind of um, perfectly, uh, you, you know, sort of understandable. 
But the problem is that the Indo-Pacific is nowhere near as compelling as China. I mean, it's not coherent. Um, it's a region um, which is centered on India with the assumption that India is a bigger ally of you know, Europe and America in particular than it actually is. I mean, India has proved with you know, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, it is not an ally, a natural ally of the West. I mean, you know, um, secondly, India is ne economically, I think about um, a third or maybe a bit more than that now, the size of China. Um, and also India is very nationalistic. I mean, you know, so there's a lot of issues about India being the center of a, an alternative, you know, kind of so, sort of political economic group. Um, and, you know, I think the aspiration about having an Indo-Pacific alternative to China, which we can work with, and, you know, things like the Quad um, and AUKUS and all of these other things, ASEAN, is that while um, they address this problem of what the alternative is, the brute reality, I think, is that actually there isn't an alternative. China's dominance is so huge um, that it is hard to think how you would create meaningful collaborations where China um, is not, you know, is not really kind of central to those. Um, so I, I'm, I mean, I think it's, you know, laudable and good and, you know, yeah, it makes sense that people would want to create an alternative kind of to China. But I just don't think it's very workable. Um, the bottom line is that we have to create a structure. And a lot of countries are trying to do this or, or actually, you know, like Japan and South Korea, maybe they've already kind of done it where you just balance your different needs and nothing takes priority. So you you kind of don't divide things between security and economics. You say, OK, economically, we need to have robust relations and that makes us stronger and China contributes to that. But we're very clear about where the red lines are and we kind of know what we will do and what we won't do with China. Um, and we, you know, I think Australia, uh, Europe, they're kind of learning to do that now. Um, you know, with Huawei and companies like this, they're saying, no, we don't want you, but they're saying, yes, we don't, we do want other things. Um, but I think that they've left it quite late. I think they've left it quite late. The golden rule, I think someone told me, and I think it's really true, the golden rule of European policy and American policy towards China, the golden rule is we are always five years too late. We're always five years too late. You look at every policy, you know, it's always we kind of think about things five years after they should happen. So all this stuff about, you know, kind of, um, you know, stopping China work in certain areas of technology. And this, I mean, it's five years too late, maybe even more. So I think we have to accelerate our understanding of where the boundaries are between what we think is good for us and what we don't think is good for us and stick to those principles. Um, and we have to do that quickly we have to do that quickly thank you uh, i don't know if that i hope, hope that answers a complicated question not an easy question but i hope that answers it up to a point um now we have professor dan Jovic, who is professor uh, um, from the uh, political science faculty in zagreb and also director of the board of our foreign policy forum professor Jovic. Thank you so much, and thank you once again, Professor Brown. I mean, it really was a pleasure to to hear your uh, your views on on this topic. And as as I was actually listening to this, um, I was particularly interested in this relationship between like communism and nationalism that you actually brought uh, into the daylight again. Because I remember, of course, when Yugoslavia was falling apart, um, Chinese some of the Chinese theorists criticized and explained this failure of Yugoslavia and of the Soviet Union by the lack of nationalism or uh, you know, inability of Yugoslavia to create Yugoslav nationalism and Soviet Union Soviet nationalism. But of course, we are no strangers to this you know, communist informed nationalist in contents 
um, uh, 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 if I may just reverse this, you know, old Yugoslav communist symbol, which was the other way around, that in fact it would be national in form and communist in content. So it didn't happen actually. And I remember also the other point they were making, and this is that it was of course too late to say who had won in 1989, that yeah? we will only see really whether this is communism of Chinese characteristics at the, at the end or West with this liberal uh, practices. But my question really uh, relates to the, the war in Ukraine. And uh, it's rather simple, but I know it's not a simple answer, certainly that we can, anyone can offer to this. And what do you envisage to be the consequence for China really of this? I mean, is China one of the benef beneficiaries of this war, benefactors or, or not really? Yeah. No, that's a great uh, a question. I mean, on, on the, um, just on the first one, communism, nationalism, I mean, I was in Belgrade about four years ago in Serbia, and I remember, for some reason, I just was interested in going to Tito's um, death, you know, the place where he's buried, uh, Marshal Tito, and um, <laughs> the only other people there were Chinese. And I remember this, this delegation, this huge delegation from Shanghai, and I was just really fascinated, and so I asked the Guy, I said, why, why are you coming? And um, this uh, you know, delegation leader uh, from Shanghai said, well, to pay respects to a brother of the socialist world, you know, and, and it kind of reminded me, uh, it made me think actually our, our understanding of modern history and China's understanding are sometimes completely different. Um, and, and so I think they do look at, you know, the, the Soviet Union's collapse and, um, you know, the, the, the breakup of the uh, Yugoslavia, you know, federation of them um, uh, in the 90s. Uh, and they just think this is, yeah, this this is what we want to avoid, okay? This is everything we want to avoid. Um, and, and so on Ukraine and Russia, I mean, I think um, obviously recently there's been changes, you know, Xi Jinping and he's meeting with Biden and, and with the German chancellor um, and others has, has clearly kind of made some changes, you know, that they don't support the use of, of nuclear weapons, of course, um, they seem to, I think, have probably realized that the, the, the invasion has been a big, a big mess, right? a big failure. Um, but I think, I think the other problem is that they're not natural allies. They're not allies at all of NATO. You know, so they, they've really tried to kind of balance. I think one thing that it's proved to me is that this idea that China is seeking a strong global role. I think the Russians' invasion of Ukraine has shown that, um, no, I don't think they are. Because if they wanted to exploit this, they would have been mediators, everyone would have loved them, you know, they would have been able to use some leverage over Russia. And they have just been very passive, very, very passive. Um, I think the second thing is that, I guess it's, um, you know, what Russia did with Ukraine has maybe made them much more um, risk averse with management of Taiwan. So I know um, the language on Taiwan and the um, guy who's been made the head of the Central Board is being reappointed the head of Central Military Commission in China. Uh, you know, he's quite a hard liner on um, Taiwan, but that's because they have to be. Um, but I can't imagine that they look at the problems Russia has faced despite going into this conflict feeling so confident um, and also, you know, kind of draw some conclusions for themselves, which is that war is very, very high risk. And they, um, you know, once more, um, Russia to them is a teacher of failure. I think Russia is the great textbook of failure. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, everyone says, oh, China and Russia, they're a great relationship. No, I think it's a really unbalanced relationship where um, China just looks at Russia as a um, constant lesson in how not to do things. So I think um, with this invasion, that's something that, uh, you know, they will be looking at. Um, will they have a stronger role, you know, kind of trying to mediate as, you know, maybe this issue is resolved? Well, it's kind of interesting. I mean... I, I, I mean, they might. Um, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, is also one of these people who's way over retirement. He's 72, but he's been kept on the Central Committee. And, you know, he's obviously played a big role with this. 
But I think that they don't want an outcome where the West can say it won. You know, I think they don't want that. They, they're they going to kind of probably want something where it's just very face saving and, you know, kind of Russia can basically say it did get something and which, which is going to be very difficult. But I don't think that they would want you know this to be another proof of the resilience, you know, of um, the Western system. They don't want that. Um, finally, on the sanctions. So we look at the dual track world. So the dual track world is the sanction world. Um, if you look, the sanctions are, you know, Europe, America, um, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, the sort of. And then about 150 countries that have not put any sanctions on um, Russia at all. And that, I think, is the world that China wants to be influential in. So that's Central Asia, Middle East, Latin America and Africa. So that's the dual track world. Uh, the transactional world and the idealistic world, you know, the transactional world where China is very, very influential now, but probably doesn't really have a big vision. And then, you know, the kind of um, uh, the, the sanctioning world, which is, um, you, you know, kind of uh, obviously economically still important, but probably declining. So I think that's been important to look at those sort of different sanction regimes and realize that that does show the dual track world in action. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry. Um, we have um, uh, Dr. Senada Shelashabic from the Institute for, for Development and International Relations. Senada, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sarana. Professor Brown, this was uh, really an excellent, excellent uh, um, uh, lecture on um, uh, speech. And I am prompted to have many questions, but on your last point of the transactionalist or uh, uh, dual nature of Chinese um, engagement with the West, I want to use the example of human rights and how China challenges the universality of human rights. And my question is whether you think this is um, that China uses this strategy to upset the West, or it actually is building an alternative human rights model in a sense that potentially it could appeal to the global South. And although we may think that China does not have global ambitions in a sense that it wants, as you said, it does not want to be a mediator in the Ukraine uh, uh, war. It does not, it does not want to um, uh, impose its own uh, view, but is more restrained, at least for the time being. Um, is there a scenario in which China changes its ambitions? And if this, could be something benevolent or, or soft as human rights? Or is there a possibility that we in the West, because as you said, we feel that we lost time and we are lagging behind, that we may decide to force forward and basically push China into action that it may not necessarily consider for the time being meaning that it becomes more proactive trying to find uh, partners and, and uh, actors on the global scene that may unite it against, against the West. And if that is so, is there any possibility that India and China would ever cooperate in a sense against, against the current West? Yeah, I mean, um, under its current uh, kind of situation, I don't think China would, um, it would definitely not want to be seen to be promoting things that are describable as values. I think that's what it opposes. Um, it doesn't mind it, uh, kind of promoting messages about, uh, you know, kind of development, economic benefit, um, you know, uh, the idea of countries being uh, independent, not interfered in, you know, I think it's probably in, um, it's happy to promote those sorts of messages. But I think it has resisted talking about values. And I mean, it, it talks about harmony. It talks about, you know, kind of balance, but that's as much as it talks about. Partly because I think it's very defensive. I mean, it doesn't want to talk about values for others when others then can talk about values for it. Um, 
but also partly because I think it regards itself as a very unique actor with very unique values. That's the problem. I mean, that's the problem. Uh, Chinese values are Chinese, as I said earlier. So I don't think it believes that countries in the global south can um, have, you know, adopt these values because they're Chinese values, right? I mean, you know, they're very culturally specific. And, and so I think the problem is not that we've got a China coming into the world with a message that others might respond to and sign up to and, you know, say, yay, we belong to China. We don't belong to you know America and that lot because, you know, this is a new group of values we can believe in. The problem is that we have an actor coming onto the global stage who does not want to promote values. I mean, that's so so it's not that it's got different values. It's that it doesn't want to promote values. And that is a really very different kind of thing. If we were dealing with a China which was assertive about particular values, then we would really have a clash, but we'd know what we were dealing with. The problem is that we are dealing with a partner that says to us, your values are fine for you because you're Europeans or Americans, or whatever, and you can think they're universal for you, but they're not universal for us. So let's not talk about them. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, and I think also, you know, over the last, um, you know, 30 years, I've been dealing with human rights dialogues on China. And I think we need to ask ourselves questions about how we, you know, I think there was a period maybe when China was interested and that definitely has gone. I mean, it, it sort of definitely didn't work. And I think we need to really wonder, well, how did that happen? You know, I, I never would have thought 30 years ago that we'd end up with Xi Jinping saying, no, 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 go. We don't want your values. They're awful. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think the answer to the, you know, the, this complicated question you've asked, and it's a very good question, but it, I mean, I think the problem is China does not have anything it's promoting. I mean, and that's really, um, you know, it's promoting a particular economic model, a growth model, a development model. Yeah, the China model, as you, you could call it, but it's definitely a model which has no underpinning values, I don't think. Um, I mean, you know, and um, the funny thing about values in China's politics, if they become more and more culturally sort of nationalistic, I mean, more and more Confucian, you know, Xi Jinping is a Confucian Leninist, you know, kind of talking about the Confucian sort of way in ways which would not have been true in the Maoist period. So it's really kind of constructed this unique thing that only makes sense for it. Um, you know, I can look at it as an outsider and study it, but could I believe in it? Not in a million years. This is why I find these debates about Chinese influence in Europe very hilarious. I mean, I've been going to Chinese party schools and dealing with communist officials and sitting through their lectures on Chinese values for 20 years, 25 years. I couldn't believe in it if I tried. I mean, it's like listening to Harry Potter. You know, I mean, I, it's a fiction. To me, it's a fiction. I listen to this stuff. I mean, I, I've tried, you know, I try to think, OK, is this stuff something I can use in my life? No, it's a fairy story. So I find it very strange that people that have you know, suddenly become very nervous about China coming and, you know, sort of, well, good luck with that. I mean, I, I find that very unlikely. Uh, the problem is not that China speaks a powerful story about its values. The problem is that it speaks a story that no one really would be able to believe. It's a very different problem. Thank you. Thank you. We have another written question posed by uh, Mr. Mirko Sapkowicz, who is PhD student at the University of Munich. Um, actually, he has two questions. The first one on the idea of Western decline. How explicit and confident are Chinese strategists about this expectation that the West is in decline? From my very dated and only in translation readings, my impression was that caution was the core word in Chinese foreign policy. Is that so? Even transsectionism um, when fit in a way, uh, when fit in as a way of avoidance of conflict. Uh, the second question is more provincial on what may be Chinese European policy. How much understanding there is among Chinese decision makers for European special relations with US? We see that as some point China approaches countries, countries um, separately 
um, or as the forum 16 plus one, while you mentioned that there are areas in which Europe may be more willing to cooperate with China than with US. Yet it seems to me that Europe could use it only if continent achieves some level of strategic autonomy and dividing Europe doesn't help it. Yeah, I mean, on the second one, strategic autonomy, just quickly, I mean, I think it's um, a good aspiration. Um, and, you know, but at the moment, um, as we see with uh, NATO and the, the, you know, the Ukrainian situation, uh, it would be a pretty um, strange thing for Europe to um, alienate America, um, because as a security actor, America is still very, very important. And so, you know, it doesn't seem to me a very rational thing for Europe to kind of say, okay, we, we're definitely gonna kind of have a relationship with China, which is so strong that it would antagonize America. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, I, I think we've got to balance. We don't have any choice. Um, so strategic autonomy is, I suppose, a nice thing to believe in, but I don't know how easy it is to practice it because uh, America does have a big, big um, power over Europe, of course. I mean, it, it, you know, that's, that's um, and that, I can't see that ending anytime soon. Um, I mean, the so that kind of comes to the, you know the issue of the, the the kind of question before of you know kind of foreign policy um do, 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 do chinese policy makers understand um you know kind of the, the the role of the you know the kind of the united states uh and and europe together i mean i think they do i mean i think they do understand that but they also understand that it's not um, a link that uh, they're likely to break easily because they've had opportunities to do it. They had it in 2004 when there was the arms embargo argument between Europe and America. And America basically said, if you do this, we're you know, not going to work with you. And America, you know, Europe, Europe went with America. Um, and then they did it again, I suppose, uh, during the trade wars when, um, you know, you remember there was that kind of moment when, uh, you know, kind of Europe, I think Li Keqiang came to Europe and, you know, there was this chance of, doing a particularly sort of separate trade deal with Europe, which meant that, you know, we'd have an opportunity because of what America was not willing to do. And then, you know, basically the Europeans went to Washington and were told, look, if you do that, there'll be consequences. And so, you know, it didn't happen. So I think China is um, reconciled to uh, Europe not being um, able to de-link itself from America. Um, and, you know, it may have had hopes about that in the past, but I think it's long, um, you know, kind of, you know, sort of long um, given up. On Western decline and how much are Chinese, um, I mean, I think the, the thing is that um, the evidence they see as of today is of Western decline. It will only change if, you know, America in particular finds a coherence and resilience which makes it a more you know kind of balanced actor than it is at the moment i mean that may happen you know we may be going through a phase where suddenly you know kind of europe and america come out and they look more stable than they did before i mean that would be a wonderful outcome but as of today i think china sees divisions it sees economic weakness it sees um you know kind of lack of confidence and that would need to change for China to change its view. I don't think China looks down on uh, Europeans and Americans, uh, but it certainly um, has become more and more unidealistic about them, much less idealistic than it was. Uh, and I don't think that will change unless we change. We might, we might not. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any other question? I can't see you. So if anyone has a question, please speak out. Um, um, if not, okay. uh, then um, um, you, yeah. I, I would just like to thank you, Kerry, for thank your you. time, for your knowledge, for your willingness to share it with us. Um, we hope this is yes. not the last time um, that we have it um, on our forum. And well, uh, we will be reading you. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I'm humbled by the uh, uh, amount of experience and knowledge uh, of this group. So I feel like I'm, 
um, you know, kind of really presumptuous to talk to a group that knows so much. And it would be wonderful uh, maybe in the future to meet you all in person, because I would love to hear your perspectives about uh, many of the things, you know, we've talked about. Um, and I'm sure they will have changed by the time we meet. So uh, thank you so much for, for, you know, being so good to talk to. And I've learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank, thank everyone for coming. Thank you very much.